Lulu. Where I come from, we are no longer ruled by kings and queens. We are no longer entirely subject to their whims because all men and women can collectively determine what we wish to make of our country. Elf, are things better? Lulu, somewhat. I would like to say yes. It took the women of my country nearly a hundred years to gain the vote. Many times, we're still treated cruelly, but we now have a tool by which to make change, provided we cooperate. Bear, so what do you suggest we do about King Tommy? Lulu, remove him from power, of course. But in doing so, do you want to go back to the bad old days of King Drac Dobbin? No? Then we need to think about what comes after. What kind of world do we want and what are the steps we need to get there? This snippet of script is from my latest musical, Revolution in Fairyland. The story follows the adventures of two young people from the 1920s who are stranded in Fairyland. One is the son of a wealthy shipping insurance magnate. The other is the daughter of a widowed suffragist and who grew up attending marches with her mother. The young man becomes caught up in court intrigues. He is tricked into helping Fairyland become a new colonial power. The young woman, on the other hand, foments democratic revolution with Fairyland's citizens. My involvement in theater has been a winding path. In the 1980s, I studied at the University of Washington, thinking I would be writing musical theater. Part of the way through, I found the need to focus on other types of writing in order to make a living. Not until my 40s did I return to theater. Australia has had a vibrant culture of independent theater. Vibrant, but by no means supported by its government. The Arts Council of England in 1998, the International Arts Bureau in 2000, and the Canadian Council for the Arts in 2005 all published comparisons of arts funding in a selection of OECD countries. Australia, the US, and Ireland spent the least on arts of that selection of three studies. Ireland's situation was nevertheless improving. In Australia, where I live now, we have seen a steady trend of cuts, which as of this year culminated in the federal arts portfolio being shuffled into the transport portfolio and all but entirely defunded. I had to learn how to produce my own projects and find an audience for them. I won awards and garnered five-star reviews and standing ovations, enough to keep me going, even though musicals have been unable to provide a living. I decided it was worth my time because my shows had clear impact on their audiences, particularly when I chose topics meant to inspire people to engage with social and environmental issues. I like making it possible for people to take action on a subject immediately after performance. This helps them engage with the role of activist. My show Herd of Elephants about elephant conservation raised significant money for the Thin Green Line, a nonprofit that trains park rangers from Kenya and around the world. Each night, my actors in turn would shake a tin for people to donate. Thin Green Line were surprised at the number of bills that went into this and not just change. My production company did this again for Cher, a musical about youth unemployment and homelessness. This time we raised money for Launch, a nonprofit that provides housing for the homeless. Why theater? Live theater is a potent political tool. That tool can be used to encourage pro-social behavior. Four of the key aspects of theater that make it so effective are, one, audiences observing real human beings, portraying emotions in real time 
sparks greater empathy, according to studies, than cinema, television, and even reading. According to Professor J.P. Green in her paper, Learning from Live Theater, the effect of field trips to see live theater demonstrates that seeing plays increases student tolerance by providing exposure to a broader, more diverse world and improves the ability of students to recognize what people are thinking or feeling. Empathy has a skill aspect that is improved by theater going. Two, storytelling of all sorts is memorable. Storytelling helps us to structure facts in a way that makes them more available to cognition. Jennifer Oker, a professor of marketing at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, says that people remember information when it is woven into, into narratives up to 22 times more than facts alone. Three, experiencing theater provides a more complete picture of consequences. If someone reads that a large percentage of people will die if the levees protecting their town aren't fixed, that person might go, oh yes, lots of dangerous things happen in this world. Nothing about their, this information is personal enough for them to feel they need to take immediate action. If they see a play where someone who reminds them of their mother dies as a consequence of no one taking responsibility for the levy, they may feel more inclined to take action to fix the levies. Four, stories can provide inspiring models for behavior. If the playwright has done their job well, the audience will be engaged in how certain characters think, feel, and what actions they take. These characters' journeys of discovery become the audience's journey of discovery. No lectures are needed because people can see for themselves what has worked and what that means to their favorite characters. Why democracy? My shows have all been inspired by whatever I felt was the concern of the day. For Herd of Elephants, I felt a need to represent the intersections between poverty, refugees, and environmental disaster, and our complicity in the creation of these issues. For Cher, I was deeply concerned about a, a surge in homeless people sleeping on the streets of Melbourne. Within two years, there have been an unprecedented 74% increase. I had personally experienced homeless and living out of food banks when I was in my early 20s. And I was angry to see this lack of care. For revolution in fairyland, I began to feel concerned about a rise in disillusion with democracy, a rise in authoritarianism, and a lack of vision in what could be done. According to a 2019 Pew Research Center report, around the world, more people are unhappy with the state of democracy in their country than are content. Between 2017 and 2018, dissatisfaction with the way democracy is working significantly increased in roughly half the countries polled. This, increase, this increasing dissatisfaction is evident around the globe, regardless of whether the economies are advanced or emerging. The Washington Post reported in 2017, according to the Human Rights Foundation's research, the citizens of 94 countries suffer under non-democratic regimes, meaning that 3.97 billion people are currently controlled by tyrants, absolute monarchs, military juntas, or competitive authoritarians. That's 53% of the world's population. Statistically then, authoritarianism is one of the largest, if not the largest challenges facing humanity. Australian television actor Neil Pigott has commented, and as popular success became the benchmark for companies, 
popularity has become the touchstone for artists. It is our obsession with popularity and fame that sees creative and public risk-taking amongst artists in this country at an all-time low. Today, few, if any, artists of note speak out about anything much that is troubling this country. For those of us who are storytellers, we need to look closely at our tools because they have been seriously corrupted by film and television. Papers have been written about my doctoral refutation of the hero's journey. Why are we still telling stories of hierarchy? Why are we still telling stories about chosen one male protagonists? Why do we still promote the idea that stories are about conflict? All of these are antithetical to promoting democracy. We can hardly raise children to become good citizens if they are fed a steady diet of the great man theory of history. Mohandas Gandhi has said, my notion of democracy is that under it, the weakest shall have the same opportunities as the strongest. No country in the world today shows any but patronizing regard for the weak. Western democracy is as it functions today is diluted fascism. True democracy cannot be worked by 20 men sitting at the center. It has to be worked from below by the people of every village. Democracy is an impossible thing until the power is shared by all. I would say that people are angry with democracy because they do not know what it is and have been manipulated into believing that democracy can exist side by side with gross power imbalances. Revolution in Fairyland is about exactly why this image of a beautiful country with beautiful magical people ruling over it is hollow and dangerous to our well-being. But from the beginning, Revolution in Fairyland needed to go further than that without a vision of what people can be. People can become inclined toward nihilistic violence where they express their frustration without any hope of change. It becomes an act of suicide. I spent nearly 20 years as a policy writer for the Australian Democrats. I did not get paid for this, but I knew what I created would be seen and sometimes even make a difference. With this experience, I thought hard about what would make for a healthy, peaceful society. I thought hard about what some countries were doing right and how. I also thought hard about what was essential to creating a stable democracy. A country simply not being at war with itself or others is not in fact peace. Authoritarian governments can offer a stillness that resembles peace, where people's hearts are suffocating from fear of one another. This is like a stagnant pond that has been cut off from its stream. No waves are made, yet the whole thing is experiencing a decline into oxygen death. What we need is peace like a river, something strong, dynamic, growing and capable of including many currents which are all flowing toward a higher good. Highest priority is developing a culture of compassion and cooperation. These are made real to us by our everyday interactions and our stories. It is all our responsibility to look out for each other's well-being. This is not so onerous when we are willing to do this collectively. In such a society, people can afford to trust one another and do not need to fear the outcomes of elections. In Revolution in Fairyland, I work hard to create complex characters with plenty of nuance. I have a likable playboy who is easily led astray because he grew up in privilege. 
I have a royalist mouse who dreams of traditional power. I have a fox whose art has been censored by a spell that chokes her every time she tries to speak out. If you find it hard to hate anyone in this work, good. My characters worry about the well-being of the villains as well as the protagonists, because punishment is often a form of scapegoating whereby we are able to overlook systemic problems that informed bad behavior. That's not to say some people aren't overtly evil, but we must be very careful in making such determinations and what we do about them, lest we become villains ourselves. My personal sense after some research is that a constitution is core to establishing and creating stability within a country. A constitution is a shared vision that expresses the values and priorities of a country. It's something we can point to in order to keep on mark. It's a reminder that whether or not we always agree with how to achieve a healthy, peaceful society, we do agree on the end. I then fired up my word processing software and wrote my ideal constitution. This constitution is online for anyone to see. I openly include whole cloth certain UN documents, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Declaration of the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. What neither of these documents fully addresses is our economic rights. So that's where most of my work went. I then assumed that this was the sort of document my female lead would write to help the magical beings of fairyland to transition into a democracy. To reach that point, she asks the citizens of fairyland what they want. It is understood that this document would then go through a process of development and approval as soon as a legislative body can be established. A truly benevolent democracy is an ongoing process. As we gain in awareness and insight about the struggles of our neighbors, we must be allowed to grow and change and our most cherished, cherished documents with us. I make this point clear at several points in my play, such as the section I read out. In the last 130 years, Australia has had four constitutional conventions, the last one in 1998. I then drop tantalizing hints of what lays within. The necessity of social safety nets, a cap on wealth, and socialized elections. All the things we need to ensure security, equity, liberty, and community, the foundations of democracy. I would have loved to work more theory into the play, but then it would not be as compelling. Revolution in Fairyland was meant to have a world premiere in Helsinki this year. It will still be relevant next year. The talented Sergio Silva, whose music you heard, is currently composing songs for us while his country, Mexico, is in quarantine. I don't believe in hearts and flowers optimism, but I do believe in the sort of faith in positive outcomes that comes from a strong vision, which includes steps to its accomplishment. How else did we get to the moon? Portraying this vision in our stories is an important step. Right now, I choose to portray a democracy that sees to the needs of its people and the environment that supports them. I hope to see you all when Revolution in Fairyland finally premieres. Thank you.